today. We pray especially for those who are struggling physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We pray that we might individually strive to break through our comfort zones and to reach out to the world around us, to those who are sick and depressed, to those who are bereaved and lonely, those who are abandoned, those who are homeless and hungry, those who are lost and dying in a world without you. Father, help us to be able to reach out to them in a way that those individuals would feel comforted and would feel strengthened, would be drawn closer to you as we're drawn closer to you. Father, we ask that you bless us each. Bless us this year and in the years to come. Help us to have your eyes, your heart. Help us to be your hands, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. In this text that we are about to read, James is encouraging a group of Christians that have been scattered and dispersed to know something that they're likely already experiencing, that they are likely going through trials. However, he lets them know that faithfulness in their trials can produce something that nothing else can. Starting in verse 1, James, a bondservant of, the, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let your endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. When my Life presents us with many challenges <clears throat> and a lot of struggles, and often these struggles are designed to make us falter in our faith. Job was presented with a series of struggles designed to target his faith. He lost his children, his possessions, and his health. In Job 2, verse 9, his wife tells him to curse God and die, but Job refused. 
Similarly, Paul was afflicted with a thorn in the flesh, as we read in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Paul asked for this to depart from him, but God said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Verse 10 says, Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Christ set the ultimate example of persevering trials. He was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. He devoted his life to ministry and service to others, even to the point of sleep deprivation. He endured ridicule and unfavorable opinions from the Pharisees. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends, and he was beaten and hung on a cross willingly so that we may be forgiven. We sang a moment ago, learning all the might that lies in a full self-sacrifice. To many, Christ may have appeared weak on the cross, but all I can think of is the verse we read a moment ago that says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Our faith is strengthened through adversity, but it is a painful process. Let us not forget that our endurance through hard times build faith and brings us closer to God. As we read a moment ago in James chapter one, it says, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. As we remember the sacrifice that Christ made, let us also remember the perfect example that he set. Let us try to focus on what it means to make a full self-sacrifice, because a perfect self-sacrifice conforms us to the likeness of Christ. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ in the church. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so thankful to be here this morning, to be able to remember Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross. We're thankful for the church, for the encouragement that we have through difficult times. We're thankful for the Bible and for your word. And we're thankful for uh, the opportunity that we have for forgiveness through, through you and through Christ. We pray that you help us to remember the sacrifices that Christ made on our behalf throughout our daily lives. We pray that you help us to remember the love that was shown to us and help us to understand what it means to conform to, to Christ's will and to his example and help us to understand what it means to go through trials and testing of our, of our faith so that we may come out on the other side with greater patience and a stronger relationship with you. We pray that you help us to remember these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The cup that we're about to drink represents the blood of Christ that was spilled to wash away our sins. Just as a sacrifice made under the old law required the blood of the best animals, the new covenant established that it, uh, the new covenant that is established with Christ required the most perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice that was willingly given. Let's focus on the love and devotion that went into the sacrifice that washes our sins away. Let's think about how that sacrifice should change us. Let's think about how we need to live in order to make a full self-sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord God, we're thankful for the blood that was shed on our behalf to wash away our sins. And while we are so very sorry that our sins required such a sacrifice, we are so thankful that Christ so willingly died on the cross on our behalf to offer that. Lord, we pray that you help us to remember this love that was shown to us so that we may show that same love to others that we come into contact with throughout our daily lives. Help us to remember that sacrifice so that our faith may be strengthened, 
so that we may persevere through trials and tribulations and so that we may grow closer to you. We love you and we're very thankful for Christ. We're thankful for you and we're thankful for the new covenant that was established that gives us salvation. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free. No bears a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. The just a moment we're going to have an opportunity for the children to come down and do the kids give um, but I want to remind everyone too that uh, we also have a uh, kids corner uh, this morning as well so you can be dismissed uh, during that time giving is also a part of the sacrifice that we make to God there is something that we are asked to do uh, this is something that we're asked to do cheerfully and willingly as we give our blessings from God let's remember what is collected here is not our own it's merely something that we borrowed from God for a short period of time while we're here on earth. Let's remember that we're richly blessed and that we have much to give. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us. We pray that you take the money that is collected here this morning and use it to your glory. We pray that you help this money to go towards taking care of those who are in need, those who are sick, those who are hungry, those who are without clothing, without shelter. We pray that you help this money to be used to help further your kingdom, to spread the gospel to all corners of the earth. We pray that you help it to be used in this community and throughout the entirety of the world. We pray that you help those who are in charge to make good use of the money that is collected here today. And we pray that you be with the members of this congregation, that they may have a, a joyful heart, a cheerful heart, a willing heart when it comes time to giving. We ask that you help us all to remember to be generous and loving in the way that we sacrifice of what you've given us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving me. My soul, I want to thank you, Lord. Let us all unite us all to praise Him all. 
the kids can be dismissed to Kids Corner. Would you stand as we sing the song before the lesson, please? <coughs> I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. I could just sit, I could just sit and I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. I could hold on, I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe, I could be safe here in country road right outside of Kansas City, Missouri stands an old, white, dilapidated church building that's been standing there for 90 years with nobody inside. It was kind of one of those buildings that maybe you even see around here that's somewhat of a landmark even though nobody uses it. That was this building. It was something that a lot of people drove by in fact, a lot of the main uses of this church building were maybe for senior pictures or engagement pictures where couples would stand outside and get their picture taken against the white walls or near that stained glass. It had a hole in the very top of the building. So when you walked inside, because of a lack of shingles and the water damage happening, it was almost like a skylight that was created where you could look up and you could see the sky and on each side of it stood several different stained glass windows, most of which that had holes in them from kids throwing rocks right through that stained glass. 
Well, there was a group of men in Kansas City that were getting ready to start a church. And they were trying to think of a location where this church could meet, and they thought about this old white church building. And so this group of men that also knew several contractors decided to purchase this building and this piece of property and to make it their job to flip this church building and make it new again. And so since this had become somewhat of a landmark, the newspaper, which was the Kansas City Star, heard about this. And so what they did is they sent a reporter out there and they took their camera and they took a picture of that church building and put that picture on the cover of that newspaper. But it's the title that I wanted to bring your attention to that to me told a huge message that relates to what we're going to talk about in the next few weeks when it comes to James. The title right above that picture of the church building said this, A Job with a Higher Calling. You may not realize it, or you may, that God has called us as his people to a higher calling. And part of the reason why God has given us a higher calling is he has a better life in store for every single person, but not just us, but those that you and I interact with. You see, part of the reason why I know that our world is craving it and they're looking for it is in the fact that a lot of you have heard the same thing I have growing up, that if there is one complaint about Christians, usually this is the thing you hear, is that they're hypocrites. And I want to speak to that for just a second and say, by the way, never ever let some disobedient Christian ever keep you from heaven. But at the same time, it still speaks to the fact that those around us are looking to us And they have a higher view of us whether we want that or whether we don't. But I hope that you do because one of the things that we're going to see today is that God, when he gave us his spirit, when we put on Christ, he has empowered us to that higher life because he knows it's better for us, but he also knows it's better for those around us. Kind of an example of people around us looking at us from a higher perspective. When we were in South Alabama, one of the things that we did very often, which we still do up here, is, and that's eat Mexican food. In fact, if you see an Itzen at a restaurant, 95% of the time, uh, it's Mexican. You can see us there or you can smell it on me after I've gone there. And so we love to go to different Mexican restaurants. And the one we went to down in South Alabama had this deal that a lot of restaurants do on Sundays. And that deal is this, that if you bring your church bulletin, you will get a 10% discount. And so every single Sunday, we brought our church bulletin to get that 10% discount. And I'll never forget one Sunday while the waiter was uh, bringing the checks to uh, the table that was right beside us, we overheard this conversation. The waiter brought the check, and then the lady put out her bulletin, to which the waiter said, ma'am, I'm I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, we no longer do the 10% discount anymore. And instead of saying, hey, it's okay, it's no problem, thank you uh, for doing this for years, it's blessed and helped me and my family, With a church bulletin in hand, she begins to chew this waiter out. And not only does she chew him out, she's trying to force him to take the bulletin to which he's like, I I can't do it. You know, I'm just doing what my boss said. And, And so I was hearing all of this, and a lot of things were going through my mind. One of those was, you know, I'm pretty sure I know everybody at Robert Stell Church of Christ, but I'm just wanting to make sure of the name of the church that's on, you know, that bulletin. But I have to tell you, even that mindset was wrong. Because even though it did not say Robert Stell Church of Christ, it still had Christ's name on it. And Jesus was written all over that bulletin. God has called every single one of us to a higher way of living because he knows it's better for us, but it's also because he knows everybody else needs it. I remember in the 80s, one of the things that seemed to change a lot, at least with every stereo, every tape deck, every CD player that I got, 
is that every Christmas I would get a new one. It would have like a different description of the new type of high-definition sound. Y'all might remember that. They called it high fidelity. And the idea behind high fidelity is like if you were to listen to this stereo, it made you feel like you were in the room when they recorded it. It's what a lot of people call dynamic realism. It made you feel like you were sitting there listening to the original song. To me, that's what James is getting at, but even something that Paul mentioned is that the moment that you have given your life to Christ, it's no longer you that's calling the shots. It's no longer you that's in the central operating center, but it's Christ calling the shots. And where he says go, you go. And where he leads, that's where you follow. That's what he's getting at in Galatians 2.20 when he says, no longer Christ that's living in me. I mean, me living uh, through me, it's Christ living through me, and that's the life that I'm living, right? Based on him calling the shots, based on what he is doing and how he's working. And so that high-def sound, that, that's what he's called us to for this life here that James mentions, is this high-def life is to look and to sound exactly like Christ looked and Christ sounds. But you and I know that you can listen to the best song in the entire world, but if it's played on busted out speakers, it doesn't sound good, right? It doesn't matter how great a song actually is if that song is not played well. You and I possess the greatest truths given from the, the greatest that has ever been or ever will. And he has given us everything we need to live. And those teachings are good. Those teachings are powerful. But they are meant to be lived out. That's the context of the whole premise of the book of James. That James is calling them and he's calling us to a higher standard and a way of living. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is go very slowly through the book of James. The book of James covers a lot of different topics. It's kind of like several Twitter entries of just like quick thoughts or proverbs about different topics. And so we're going to cover those the next 12 to 14 weeks. And the reason why we picked the book of James is Brandon and I were knowing that this time of year, our thoughts and minds are on different goals, resolutions that we have with ourselves. And James is oftentimes called the book of practical Christianity. But the other reason why we decided to go with this title is as we sung the song just a minute ago, a lot of times we just sit and wait. We sit and wait for God's promises. We sit and wait for something good to happen when the goodness is for the taking, he's given us the promises. He just wants us to step into them. He has called us to a higher life. And I think especially today in a world that we can even fall into where mediocrity becomes the standard. And we start judging ourselves by ourselves or judging ourselves on what other people are doing, not on the standard in which Christ has given us. And we wonder at times why we're not making the impact. It's because we were made for more. That's what James invites us to in this study. And so what I want us to do is start in James 1 and look at verse 1, because if we understand who the author is, but also who it was written to, it'll make a lot more sense about what he's going to say next. It says this, James, he was a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Greetings. Well, who is this James? Well, there's four James mentioned in the New Testament. Two of those are apostles. One of those is the dad of one of the apostles. Then there is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, most scholars believe that the one that wrote this one was the half-brother of Jesus. Now, that's a really big deal because one of the things as you begin to look in your Bible, you will notice, and this is an amazing fact about James, is that James, the half-brother of Jesus, for a large portion of his life, did not believe in Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 7, he called him out and says, listen, you need to stop doing what you're doing. You're going to get yourself killed. And so he mocked his own brother. So what in the world happened from, hey, I don't believe in you and I'm mocking you, to now all of a sudden he's writing a book? Well, I'll tell you what happened to him. The same exact thing that happened to every single one of us that put on Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened. So as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he retells of a time where Jesus had just raised from the dead. And James, who was probably standing by thinking, well, I told you so. 
I told you you were going to get yourself killed. I told you that you were building your life around something that was fake, that was false. All of a sudden, Jesus is alive. He's seeing people. He's high-fiving folks. And all of a sudden, James, who didn't believe, now believes. And, And the reason why I want to point that out is there is a lot of people in our world, and you might know them, and you might be one of them, that is kind of like James. It it takes a little bit more evidence. It takes a little bit more time. It's a reminder for us to be patient with people, but also let the gospel do its work and the power of Jesus' resurrection also do its work too. Fun fact, uh, the, the writings of Josephus mentioned that James prayed so much that it gave this description that he had the knees of a camel that he hit his knees so much in prayer that they developed calluses. Josephus continues to write that in A.D. 62, he was thrown off the very top of the temple for preaching Jesus. The fall did not kill him, and so people were beating him with rods. And while they are beating him, he's praying for the very people that beat him. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like he saw a lot from Jesus, that he internalized more than we might realize. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention here that I think is really interesting is if he is the half-brother of Jesus, part of me would have thought that in the description it would have said James, who, by the way, I'm, you know, the half-brother of Jesus, doesn't do that. Do y'all know any people at times that name drop, you know what I'm talking about, that you could be in the middle of a conversation and it has nothing to do with that, but they just feel the need to let you know that they know somebody? Again, we don't know anybody like that, I'm sure. But why do we name drop sometimes? I think sometimes we name drop because it's pointing to the fact that maybe there's a little bit of insecurity within us that needs to point to something else for validity to point to something else to show that we are a value and important. I, I think James does not mention that he is the half-brother of Jesus because he knows that the highest calling in the world is not a, a blood relation. It, it's not being the half-brother of Jesus, but it's more important that he sees Jesus as his Lord to which he is a servant. And, and the same thing for us, that when it comes to the title that we have, It's understanding he is Lord. He's Yahweh. He calls the shots. But also, if he is that, the only logical then next step and conclusion is that you and I are his servants. That's how James saw himself. And it goes on to say that this was written to 12 tribes. And usually in the Old Testament, when it mentions that it was written to the 12 tribes, That was a term to describe tribal allotments. Back in the Old Testament, whenever God's people were scattered and and divided out, they were each given a piece of property. And and usually they were given one of 12 spots. In this case, they're not referring to literal spots or or one of the 12, 12 tribes. It's more of a figurative way to describe dispersion. And what I mean by that, the reason why this group of people are dispersed is because Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, which describes the persecution that Saul, who eventually became Paul, led and scattered the people all over the place. Now, because of the persecution, they, their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, their cousins, their aunts, they're living in scattered places all over the place. In the community that they once experienced, now they're spread all over the place. So here's what we have. We have a guy who did not believe in Jesus is now writing about him and becoming a pillar in the church to a group of people that are suffering in a big time way because they're living in places that they haven't lived before experiencing hurt and heartache like they never have experienced it before. And so the main thing he's trying to let them understand is, listen, I know you believe in the teachings of Jesus. But the things that you believe should always impact the way that it is that you and I behave. In fact, in James 2, as we're going to get to in a few weeks, one of the things that he deals with is this topic that we like to talk about a lot, which is faith and works. And and sometimes what we'll say is, well, there's faith plus there's works. Well, the reality is, is that's not how it works. If there is genuine faith, there is going to be works on the outside. 
that if there's a genuine faith on the inside, there are going to be works that are produced on the outside. But if there is a genuine faith that is producing works, that also helps us to see that there's something the opposite, right? If there's a genuine faith, there's also a what? Maybe a false faith. Well, what does that look like? Well, it's kind of hard to describe, and these aren't perfect ways to describe it or what it could be, but we do need to identify it a little bit. It could be what many might call an inherited faith. And when I say inherited faith, I'm not saying that the faith that you inherited was wrong, but it's how you inherited it and what you took from it. It's kind of like I, I can, you could have a grandparent that gives you a million dollars, but you blow that money the moment you get it. You inherited it, but, but you didn't really do anything with it. Why? Because that, that, it never became your own. It wasn't real to you. The same thing with our faith. That the faith of your mom, your dad, your grandparents, it, it might be real, it might be true, it might be genuine, but you have to make it your own. That's why last week we talked about the danger of growing old but not growing up. And, and that what can happen with every single one of us, it just not just young people alone, is you can fall in love with the, the, the teachings more than you fall in love with the teacher. That what you believe is true, but, but it has to be a part of who you are. The second one is this, that maybe a false faith could be described as like a shallow faith. It's kind of like when Jesus describes the sower throwing out seeds. And some of those seeds, they fell on soil that was surrounded by all these sorts of things that really never allowed it to grow deep, but also it never really went beneath the surface. And because of that, once things started to grow, it just got choked out. That's the reality for a lot of us is that our faith is very shallow. And like we talked about last week, because God has called us to be planted in his house, that's how we flourished. We don't establish those roots. And because of the, the faith maybe being very shallow, it's easy to be swept away. But then there's this one. Maybe we have what is called like a conditional or a circumstantial faith. This is, you know, things are going great. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good all the time. But then things go difficult. Where is God? God's gone AWOL. Does he love me? Does he care about me? Does he even exist? You see what's happening is our faith is attached to our circumstance, not to the person of Christ. And we talked about this a little bit in our study on the book of Hebrews. And I put these two slides up, and I want to remind you of those, is that difficult circumstances are going to do one of two things for us. They're going to either lead us to a deeper faith, or they're going to push us away further. They're going to solidify it, or they're going to break it. And, and the reason why it's important for us to identify whether or not we have this circumstantial faith is it's hard for us to see life as it should because we do have a, a life view, a worldview based on experiences and what only we can see in our three-dimensional time and space. And, and so what I mentioned a few months ago was that the reason why circumstantial faith is fragile is, number one, life is inconsistent, is it not? The moment you think you've got it all figured out and everything nailed down, you see things unraveling. The second thing is this, that we're really bad at interpreting events. Sometimes we'll say, this is the best thing in the entire world. This is, the, this is exactly the job that I need. And then we get that job or we do that thing and it turns out it wasn't the best thing. And then sometimes we are in a job that we're like, why am I in this? I shouldn't be doing this. I wish I wasn't here. Turns out later we realize, whoa, actually this was the very place that I needed to be. It's hard for us to interpret events as we should, but also our time frame is, is not really that long. Especially like during this time of year, with different resolutions, the, the heart behind the resolution is oftentimes change, growth. I want to be a better mom, want to be a better dad, want to be a better person. And so we're, all right, I'm going to pray every day. So you wake up on Monday and you pray, and then you get to Wednesday, you're like, well, everything didn't change. That our time frame isn't that long enough. We need to stick with stuff a little bit longer. And so what James is going to talk about is to speak to their faith that this group of people have during the middle of a trial. And when I, I thought about this text, especially the audience that it was written to, I thought about this book that we have. It's called We're Going on a Bear Hunt. And it's, it's a family that's going on a bear hunt, and they're walking through very tall grass. They're walking through trees. They're going through muddy areas. They walk through caves. And there's a line in the book that says this, as they get to a part that is an obvious obstacle, they say, well, uh, we can't go under it. 
we can't go over it. Oh, no, we have to go what? Through it. And, and that's what James is getting at here. The reality is, is that when we are presented with different trials in life, the perspective towards that trial helps us to understand there's some ones that you, you can't get around. You can't go under it. You can't go over it. You have to go through it. He teaches us how to go through it with the perspective of understanding that bad things are going to happen to every single person, but when those bad things happen, to never, ever doubt that our God is good. So here's one of the things that trials will do. They'll prove your faith. It says this in verse 2, count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Notice in the text, he doesn't say, count it all joy, my brothers, if you fall into trials. He says what? When? It's not a matter of if you're going to go through a trial, it's a matter of when. My preacher, Randy Medlin, growing up, used to always say that somebody's either going through a trial, they're leaving a trial, or they're about to go into a trial. And the reason why I mention that, it's important to have in our minds that difficult times are going to happen. It's not a matter of if, but when. And when we are prepared, it helps us to deal with it better. Because think about for you, if you're like me, what were the worst tests growing up? Pop quizzes. I, I couldn't stand those. I was like, if you would have let me know, I, you know, I would have been prepared. I would have listened. You know, if, if I would have known that there was going to be a test, I would be prepared. It's kind of like in the same way why I think most middle-aged men, most of the back injuries that they have is because their kids randomly jump on their backs without telling them. You know, if I would have been prepared, you know, I would embrace myself, or is it, maybe that's just me. But anyway, like, like some of the things in life, if you just knew it was coming, you would prepare, you would brace yourself. Trials are coming. It's not a matter of if, it's, it's when. And, and so because of that, we don't need to just have contingency plans in life. Uh, well, if things go wrong, we could maybe do this. No, when things go wrong. Things are going to go wrong, so don't have an if plan. Have a when plan. I know that might sound very kind of Debbie Downer-ish to be thinking in that way, but, but I want you to think about for just a second the reality of the importance of even vocalizing as families and individuals that if this were to happen to us, or we were to experience what I've seen other people experience, that I could not imagine, what would we do? And here's the difficult part. You don't fully know how you're going to handle everything. I mean, you can talk about something up and down all you want, but there is a value in prepping our hearts to understand that difficult things are going to happen, but also posturing our heart in the way to properly receive them. But the other thing that I want to point out about this text is he says various trials. Uh, this is the same kind of language that David refers to that he's experiencing in Psalm 116 where he's like, trials are all around me. And the trials that are all around David in Psalm 116 are a mixture of things he didn't cause, but also trials he did cause. Some trials show up in the form of temptation that you fell victim to. Sometimes trials show up in the form of of things that you didn't ask for but happened to you. And, and the reason why I want to point that out is understanding the difference between a trial and a temptation is incredibly important because then if we don't understand the difference between the two, we're going to put so much energy, the wrong kind of energy, in the wrong direction. And what I mean by that is this, that when it comes to temptations, the way that we deal with temptations is to resist, right? Yield not to that temptation. Resistance is the key. But when it comes to trials, you can't always resist a trial, can you? You didn't ask for it. You didn't want it. And so one counselor wrote this, that the posture of a trial, even though difficult, is acceptance. That, that you can't avoid it. And so I wanted us to think about it like this, that when you face a trial, we're not talking about a temptation, but a trial, the key is not resistance, but acceptance. Because we'll be spending the wrong energy, we'll accept the things we should be resisting, and we'll resist the things that we should be accepting. There's a difference between the two. And notice what he says about how to view the trial. He said, I want you to count it. Uh, this is a math term in the Greek. Some of your texts say consider. 
And, and the idea for it being a math term is that when you go through a trial with Christ, with your faith, it adds something to your life that was not there before. Now, that's very difficult because when we see the pain, uh, we don't look at the pain usually through the perspective of purpose. And this is kind of why he's saying if you can see it through the perspective of purpose, and by the way, that's difficult, but God's prep, as we all probably all know in life, often comes packed as pain, doesn't it? As difficulty, as hardships. He says that, that when you count it all joy, my brothers, when you do meet those are, that are coming, the trials of different kinds, please know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. This word steadfastness, uh, it means staying power. That when things go wrong, you say, you know what, I'm going to stay. That, uh, that I'm, I'm going to see it to the end. It doesn't say in this text that we won't go through difficulties. We are going to be bent uh, that doesn't mean we're going to have to be broken. You might have uh, seen this illustration before, but whenever a potter is forming clay, he forms it how he wants it to be, the, the pot, the plate, whatever it is, and he takes it off of that wheel that he's been spinning it on, puts it in the oven. And, and the way he knows whether or not the, the clay is ready is when it's thumped. And so when, when the clay is thumped, if it thuds, that's a signal that it's not ready. But according to them, if it sings, making a humming sound, it, it means it's ready. The reason why I say that is, because I know it sounds cheesy, but reality is we all get thumped in some way or another. Maybe in November, you were grateful for the Christmas break to get here because you might have had several meetings with the teacher about what the, your kid's doing in school. Maybe for some of you, you're dealing with a grumpy boss. Maybe some of you are in a job that you maybe don't want to be in and you're dealing with difficult people. Thumps are a part of life. They are a difficult part of life. But oftentimes, the thump reveals the character and what's going on on the inside with that person. And so once you think about this, when you are thumped, because you're going to be if you haven't already do you thud or do you sing? James is going to give us a pathway to show us how we can get to that point of singing. And, and when a faith is tested, I found this quote that I thought was so good. It's a faith that can be trusted. It's a faith that's withstood some things. It's a faith that has this experience. And again, God doesn't waste that, that pain, that hurt, but how you view it. You know, pain is going to be a part of this life. It's standard equipment for life, but the choice to be miserable, that's an option. And so here's what the trial can also do. It can produce maturity. He says this, so let that steadfastness, that staying power, let it have its full effect so you can be perfect and you can be complete and you will get to a point where you lack nothing. Maybe for some of you, you've um, talked about how you've seen that trial to help you grow. Um, as Brandon mentioned this morning and uh, Danny prayed about this morning too, Greg Clark uh, passed away. And just, you know, a picture of God in the middle of, of a difficulty has been seen throughout that family in the incredible faith of Ashley um, and, and the kids. But also something amazing to me happened last night. Brandon and I uh, were at their house, and we were getting things ready for the service for tomorrow. And she wrote down on a piece of paper um, facts about Greg, interesting things about Greg, and she wrote down his two favorite Bible verses. Would you know it that one of his two favorite Bible verses was James 1, 2 through 4? And if you know of anybody that's gone through a trial, it's that man. But something that um, his wife shared with us is that somebody had asked him, if you could go back, would you undo this? He's like, oh, no, definitely not. I've grown so much. That kind of perspective, we don't ask for it. We don't want it. But it takes a certain kind of maturity to see it in that way. I think about something that Paul Tripp said. He says, God will take you where you wouldn't go to produce in you what you couldn't accomplish. When you think about growth, we love the, uh, like I do, the eventual 
you know, picture of what growth looks like. I want to get there now. But God is oftentimes interested in the process of the growth even more than he is sometimes the eventual ending. Why I say that is because it produces this maturity in us. And so the value of maturity is greater than the value of the absence of the trial. We would, of course, no one wants the trial, but at the same time, that trial produced something in us that was not there before. The next thing is this, trials break my pride. You probably have your own example. We could probably go around the room and share tons of examples of of people when you've seen this happen in your life. And the one I'm about to give you is not on par with a lot of trials you've gone through. And I'm not trying to make it out to be. It's, It's a very small trial. But it's one of the many ones where I've seen that has broken my pride. Going into my senior year, I was looking forward to basketball more than any other thing. I had goals for myself of of what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted that to look like. And the very first game my senior year, and by the way, I kind of was telling the crowd earlier, kind of interesting how things come full circle. There's somebody that knows Brian Privet who's coaching over at MA. He helped me that whole summer. We paid money to help him teach me shoot. Uh, And so a lot was invested into basketball. I was focused on basketball very first game, ball goes out of bounds. I put my hand against the wall to stop myself, and this bone pops right out of my hand. I missed the entire senior year ex- except for the tournament. At the tournament, couldn't bend my hand back the whole way to shoot, couldn't even receive the basketball. Very frustrating. The reason why I give you that illustration, that whole summer and that whole year, my world revolved around me, my goals, my ambitions. And not that they were bad, but the focus was on me. That, that trial broke my pride. To some of you, you'll experience it in different ways, and some of the ones that you've experienced don't even come close to anything I'll ever have to go through or experience. But here's the neat thing about the pathway forward is that James gives us this. And I don't want to get too much in this because Jason and Brandon are going to cover this in their lessons in the weeks to come. But in James chapter 5, he says, well, I want to tell you this. Speaking of a trial, if any of you are lacking wisdom on that, pray. We don't oftentimes make this connection, but please see that it is. There is a direct connection between prayerlessness and pride. You might think, well, no, there's the reason why I'm not praying is I'm busy. Have you seen my schedule? We've got this going on, this going on, this going on, and this going on. It's really busyness is not is, is really why I'm not praying. No, that's not really the reason why you're not praying. It's pride because if we really understood how desperate we are for God and how much we need his wisdom and how much we need his hand, we would see that the key to overcoming pride is prayer. That constant posture of God, I need you in this and I need you in this and I need you in that. Seeing that connection, I think, will help us understand the value of that pride in being able to break it. The next thing is this, trials, they also help us to equip Equip us, excuse me, to comfort other people. It says this in 2 Corinthians 1, 4. God comforts us all in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in the middle of an affliction. Jesus said in Luke 22 to Simon Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, you know you're in trouble if you, you know, hear your name twice. Um, he said, Simon, Simon, you know, Satan, he asked me to sift you out like wheat. He asked me to, you know, kick you, but you know what I did? Is I prayed, and I prayed that your faith would not fail. Notice he doesn't say, hey, I prayed that you won't fail. He just says, I pray that your faith won't fail. That we're going to fail, but that doesn't mean our our faith has to. He said, the reason why I've prayed for you not to fail is so that you can go out, and here's what he says, strengthen your faith. Brothers, that that test, that trial that he went through was not something that God wanted to waste, but to use to help him in the future become a pillar in the church. That that trial that you're going through, God doesn't want to waste it. But the other thing that trials will oftentimes do is they'll draw us closer to God. I can't remember which book it was, but one of the lines in one of the books I read this past week says that when we go through difficult times, and God might allow them into our lives. He doesn't want to crush us. He wants to crown us. And I love that. It's the idea that, that God wants us to, to move up that, that, 
you know, that checkerboard to move up that chessboard of life and, and to make, help us make these moves to get us to a place that we weren't going to be on our own to use that, as Paul talks about, that affliction to draw us into seeing the eternal weight and the eternal glory of our God. So as I was trying to sum up how you and I can see our trials and approach them with a higher way of living, you'll notice that this morning these are the six things that we talked about. A higher way to handle our trials, it has to include prayer. But it also has to do with seeing and understanding the value of God's providence. The providence of God, by the way, is a difficult thing to even describe and define. But I think everything is provided in the word where it says provide. (laughs) Understanding that God will provide. It might not be how we want. It might be different than we thought. But also that his promises are true. When we attach ourselves to his promises, um, not what we wanted or what maybe even we thought, or our agenda. But then this one that I think is a little bit at times more difficult to come by, and that's praise. Because if you're in a trial, it's very difficult sometimes to sing, maybe. And you might have even walked into the auditorium going through one now, and at the beginning of the worship service, the words were very difficult to come by, but then by the middle to the end of the service, you found yourself being able to sing that song a little bit more. The, the more you read those lyrics, and the more you let the lyrics of those songs start to sink into your heart. When that happened, the things that are going on in your four walls or outside of your four walls that are are causing you pain, those problems through praise did not change. But the praise shifted your focus from the problem to the problem solver. That's the value and the beauty of what praise can do. But the next two we talked about today were patience, to be patient with yourself, uh, to be patient with other people, but also to persevere, to have that staying power when times get difficult. In in just a second, we're going to offer an invitation. And I've been at Madison a little over a year and a half now. And anytime somebody's come forward and, and sat down on one of these pews to ask for prayer, one of the things that I've noticed that has happened so often is that the person that walks down the aisle and sits there is going through a trial. They are oftentimes comforted by people that have just left a trial, but also by people that are going to go through a trial too. And and I I say that to say that I hope you uh, feel the warmth And the realness that's in this room of people that want to show you support, to walk alongside you, to love you, and to encourage you. But we also know that right now there's some of you that maybe have never given your lives to Christ. You know, when we talk about being empowered to a higher way of living, it's it's exactly what Paul said in Galatians 2.20. I can't be calling the shots. There has to be a higher standard than me in the operating center. When you give your life to Christ and you put on Christ in baptism, you are given what the Bible says is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is Christ living in you. And so now you no longer live your life according to your own standards, but you're empowered to live your life the standard that God has given you. And so when I, when I think about that, and I think about the trials that we talked about today, Some of the trials that we go through, God does deliver us from. Some he may not. But the good news is that even though he doesn't deliver us from a trial, the better news is that he does save us from our sins. And not just some of them. He saves us from all of them. And so if you want to put on Christ today, or if you maybe want to get the encouragement from the family here, you can walk down front, or we're also going to have shepherds at every single one of the exits that want to pray with you or for you. If you don't feel like you want to walk in front of other people, whatever it is that we want that you're dealing with, we want to support you, uh, love you. Whether you're going into a trial, you just left one, and we want to praise God with you, or you see that you're about to, we want to support you and encourage you while we stand and sing the song together. with my
Um, we love her very, very much and her family very much. Uh, she said, um, and, and she had a conversation probably like a lot of you have had, um, when, you know, your kids hear about Greg's loss, uh, or um, our loss. Um, Greg is experiencing life right now in a much more real way than we are. Um, but when the reality of that hits, your kids have questions, and, and they wonder and think about things. But she had mentioned this morning just the faith of her child to put life in perspective, to know you don't have to worry that Greg has received, as you said your son put it, his crown. And, and it hit her that she wants to do a better job in her example to her kids to show faith really well. And that's the job that God has called us to as parents, but it's also a communal job for us as the church to support you in that and to also encourage all of our kids in that. Um, and God works with broken hearts. He bro- works with contrite hearts, the, the Bible says. And so uh, in just a second, I'm going to ask, uh, actually right now I'm going to ask Mike Dozier, if he doesn't mind, one of our shepherds, to pray for Christina. Um, she wants to grow in that example. And we appreciate you so much in your heart for wanting to do that. We love you very much. Our Father, we come before you this morning on behalf of Christina. Father, we pray for her this morning, for her willingness to come set a wonderful example to all of us. We, we are so much in thought of the Clark family this morning, Father, and how that has affected all of us. But to see the faith of this family as they've gone through this trial. And Father, it reminds all of us that we want to be better Christians. We want to be better mothers, better wives, better husbands, better fathers to our family. And we pray this morning for Christina that she can be just that, a better uh, example to her family, uh, of her faith. Father, we can all say that we need more faith. And help us, Father, as we are either in the trial, leaving the trial, or ready for the next trial, that we will strengthen our faith. We will look to you. We will reach out for your encouragement and your strength that we can get through those trials and that we can indeed counted all joy. Father, we thank you for this congregation. We thank you for 
the family that meets here at Madison. We again, thank you for Christina and the Bradford family and what they mean to this congregation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Zaid Wormack has come forward, and he wants to put on Christ in baptism. Zaid is the uh, uh, grandson of Miss Pam Hollis, and uh, Travis, his dad, uh, and, and the family, too, are down here with him uh, to celebrate in this. We talked about this is the greatest decision he will ever make in his life, uh, and we are so proud of you, Zaid, in this decision. This is just the beginning uh, of your journey and your faith walk, and we want to walk alongside you and be with you as, as you grow in your faith. And so his dad, uh, Travis, is going to take his confession, and then we're going to go back here and prep uh, for his baptism. Zay, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do.
who have uh, kids in Kids Corner, you can exit now and go pick those kids up. Let's all stand together as we sing the closing song. We'll sing, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, after which we'll be led in closing prayer. Father, it's, it's been good to be here this morning, uh, to be able to enjoy coming together and worshiping you. And Lord, we rejoice this morning with Zaid and his um, decision to put you on Christ. And we just ask you to, to, to help his faith to grow and help us to be an encouragement to him. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. And we ask that you just continue to bless us in, in this coming year. Pray that we'll keep you... Uh, keep you at the center of our life. Pray that you give us the strength to face face the trials that we face. And pray that you'll give us a, a faith that will not fail. Uh, thank you for the eternal life that we have through Christ. Uh, thank you for uh, his willingness to, to die to make that possible. And we off, offer up this prayer in his name. Amen. <laughs> 